You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options. The program where the name pretty much says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is over there on the futures options side of the fence. What's going to make it onto the show this week? Ags, metals, rates, equities, energy, you never know. So I get to tune in every week. My name, of course, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as from the ever-engaging, at least we tend to think so, Options Insider Radio Network. If I sound back to normal, it's because I'm back from the Southern Studio, back here in our Chicago studio, having a good time. Good weather here, actually. <laughs> actually, a little bit nicer here than it was back down in the Southern Studio. It's that interesting time of year, listeners. Everything's in flux. But you know it's not in flux, listeners. It's all the content coming at you on the network. If you like Twifo, if you like the full network, make sure you throw some stars our way. It does help new people continue to discover the content. It's hard to believe. We've been doing this for a long time. Hard to believe there are new folks to discover it all the time. Yet they are out there. They need your help. So throw some stars our way if you do like what you hear. Look at the numbers out there, the volume numbers. They continue to explode in the world of options. So new people trading options all the time. They need some content to help them out. FIFO and the rest of the network is there for them. And, of course, if you want even more content, you want more help, who can blame you? These are crazy, troubling times. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. We have great Q&As with some of the best minds in the world of options and derivatives, including futures options, rotating through our hot seat there on the pro side, as well as options oddities every week where we break down some of the crazy trades you should be paying attention to out there. So a lot of great stuff. Live access to this. Everything else that we do. Giveaways. Just give away our pro trading crate. Congratulations to Tony P., the winner of our March Pro Trading Crate. I know he's been waiting for a couple of years <laughs> for his chance to finally win. So it came. He was patient, and it came, listeners. You, too, can win fabulous prizes. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. As we go out and see who's joining us today in the CME Group hot seat, I am pleased to welcome back an old friend, even though it has been quite some time since we have chatted, Mr. Eric Norland, the senior economist over there at CME Group. Eric Welcome back to Twifo, sir. It has been too long. Thank you so much for having me. It has been too long, and it's been uh, 
I've missed you guys. <laughs> My producers are telling me it has been nearly two years. It has been since July of 2021. Is that right? Can that be possible, Eric? Have we not chatted since July of 2021? You know, it just doesn't seem like it's been that long, but I'm not going to argue with your producers. I'm sure you know the producers are always right. <laughs> they are always right. So, I, I think your buddy Blue has been hogging all the spotlight over there. He's been fighting his way in. You got to elbow him out of the way. Say, it's my turn to talk now, Mr. Blue. But yeah, <laughs> so, you know, kind of a boring period. Not much really happening since July of 2021, Eric. So I'm glad. I'm sure you had a pretty quiet, restful time, sir. Oh, yeah, you know, it's been really chill, especially the last couple of months. You know, last year we just had, you know, the first bear market, the real bear market that we've had in stocks uh, since, um, you know, since 2008. You know, it's been very quiet. You know, it's it's been uh, you know, just very chill and you know, not, not really a lot to talk about. So that's <laughs> probably why I haven't been on. Quiet on the research front, not a lot of numbers to crunch. You had time to catch up on a lot of things because, you know, not much was going on. So I'm glad we could finally break you out of your doldrums. And get you back here on the show, Mr. Eric, because it is time for the Movers and Shakers Report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everyone, welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show where you break down all the upside and dark side movers out there on CME this week. If you want to see this report for yourselves, it's one of the few free reports you can get that, you know, the premium stuff over there from our buddies at Bantus. Obviously, you can get the TWIFO reports all week long as well, but they offer a lot more than just that. And so if you want to scratch the surface on some of the other offerings, you know where to go. Bantix.com is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. Request that free trial. I think you're going to be happy that you did because there is a whole bunch of data we just don't have time to get to here on the show. A lot of fascinating stuff. But if you check out this report we tweeted out at Options, of course, our friends over there at CME tweeted out as well. You would see it's a mostly green biased week. Looks like we're roughly, roughly, I'd say two thirds in the green and about a third in the red out there. So a lot to unpack on it this week. I know, Mr. Eric, you haven't joined us in a while, so you may have forgotten how this works, but this is the portion of the show where you choose a direction for us to begin, sir. Should we look to the light side first or to the dark side? Well, you know, they just announced three new Star Wars movies, right? So I think that oh. the only way, the, it's what I read the other day in the press, and so the only way there can be a new Star Wars movie is if something has awakened on the dark side of the floor. So otherwise, there's no plot, Ooh, right? I like it. I like it. I think it. we have to start with the dark side. I think that was out in your neck of the woods. I was in London. They had that big Star Wars gathering. Were you out there in your Wookiee costume? You know, I wasn't. Um, I was hoping to go as an Ewok, actually, because I think it fits me better than a, than, um, a Wookiee. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, yeah, I think that... Uh, it's um yeah, you know, I heard that Daisy Ridley is gonna be in it. So Ray is coming back. It's gonna be some sort of sequel to the sequel trilogy. I, I can picture you in an Ewok costume. That that is kind of scary. So instead, let's uh, let's keep on rolling right on into the dark side, listeners. To the dark side we go. We got a quite a smattering of complexes here in our movers and shakers this week, listeners. Kind of shows you what kind of week we have. It's all over the place. Uh, number five, we're going out to the rates first for the ultra 30 year. You know, it's maybe a bit of a quiet week in one direction when we see the ultra 30 year pop up doesn't usually make it onto our movers and shakers. That's moving a little bit this week off about one and three quarters percent for the number five spot to the dark side. Number four, uh, we're off to ags. It's corn listeners off about 2.2 percent. Then number three, back to rates. Three months so far off about 2.39 percent. Uh, still hanging out in rates for number two. It's euro dollars off 3.07 percent. And number one to the dark side, back to ags, listeners, it is KC Wheat, off about 3.15%. And then up to the light side we go, number five, still hanging out in ags, soybean meal, up 3.4%. It was number five in the other direction. It was off about 2% last week, so interesting couple of weeks for beans. If you've been listening to the show for the last couple of months, you know beans have been making it on with some frequency, so a lot of action out there across all of the different aspects of soybeans out there. Number four, we're off to metals, listeners. It's platinum, up 3.89%. Number three, back to ags, the softs in particular. It is one of our frequent offenders. It is lumber, up 4.91%. If you know lumber, it's actually kind of a quiet week <laughs> for lumber. Uh, number two, hanging out in rough rice now, up 6.7%. It was number two in the other direction last week, off about 5.5%. 
And the number one light side mover this week, one of our other frequent offenders, it is Bitcoin up 8.83%. So crypto, we got ags, we got metals, we've got rates, all kinds of things in our movers and shakers this week, listeners, including two of our three frequent offenders. All we're missing is Nat Gas. Now, Eric, this is normally where I'd have you choose a complex that we start in, but a lot of your research has been interesting. You're looking at a lot of the intersections of different complexes, maybe the nexus they're in. So I suppose, I guess, we could start our first one. It's kind of a bit of a crossover between energy and ag, so I guess we'll start there first. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, listeners, welcome to the wonderful world of energy. You know where to find these reports for yourself. See me, group.com slash twifo. Uh, then go into your drop down to energy two slots and then over. We're going to start in crude oil. But as I mentioned there, we're going to kind of throw the script out this week, listeners. We're going to kind of merge products because Eric's got some interesting new research out there. In particular, Eric, you've been looking at the the nexus between crude oil prices and crop prices out there, which I think for a lot of our listeners who are maybe, like I mentioned, there's been a new influx of listeners just across the board over the last few years of the pandemic. And for the case of this show, Twifo, an aggressive upswing just in the last six months out there. So we have a lot of new listeners coming to the show, Eric, who when I say that out loud, I say the oil crop price nexus, they might be saying, what the hell are you talking about? That might, that might just completely throw them for a loop. So maybe let's start there. What are you talking about, Eric, when you're talking about the oil crop price nexus? Okay, so since the beginning of this century, in the last 23 years, um, if you graph either corn, wheat, or soybeans, or soybean oil for that matter, um, on top of crude oil, so you just put sort of side-by-side -side chart comparisons you see that a lot of times they're doing the same thing. You know, when crude oil prices are high, crop prices tend to be high. When crude oil prices are low, crop prices tend to be low. And on a day-to-day -day basis, they tend to be positively correlated, not extremely highly, uh, but somewhat highly, you know, like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 correlations. Um, and so what's going on here, I think, is two things. First, um, farming is a very energy-intensive business. Uh, for every one calorie of food you eat, on average, there were 10 calories, energetic calories of petrol energy that went into making that food possible. Um, so you can't really plow fields, plant crops, harvest crops, take them to market without crude oil. And then also a lot of other things in farming are derived from crude oil, um, including pesticides, which is a derivative of crude oil. Um, and then you also have other things that are not derived from crude oil, but are still energy related. For example, fertilizer uh, was a combination of potash, um, ammonia, which is produced from natural gas, uh, which in many parts of the world, natural gas can be correlated to crude oil. Um, that's particularly true throughout Europe and Asia. It's less true of the U.S. where Henry Hub is sort of in its own, its own little world. Um, so on the cost side of agriculture, they're very closely related. Uh, but then on the output side, they're also closely related. What's one of the major uses for corn other than corn on the cob at Memorial Day or Fourth of July barbecues? Well, one of the major uses for it is to create ethanol, which is for blended primarily into gasoline. Um, and then soybean oil um, and palm oil and other kinds of vegetable oils can also be used as fuel additives, uh, most commonly in diesel, uh, sometimes in gasoline, but primarily in diesel. Um, and so... The ag market is connected both on the input and on the output side to crude oil. Yeah, it's fascinating. Obviously, I've been aware of this relationship for a long time. But until I looked at your report, Eric, and I saw the graphs, I wasn't aware of just how closely these move. By the way, listen, you should check this out for yourselves. If you get on over to cvgroup.com, click on the education of the research tab there, and you'll find this report is called What's Causing the Break in Oil Crops Price Nexus. It just came out about a week ago out here. So this is breaking research here. And scroll down to some of these charts. You can see the chart of WTI versus corn, WTI versus wheat, WTI versus the beans, and uh, even soybean oil. And, and Eric, it's surprising, as you mentioned, for this century in particular, it's really, it's really been a, an impressive uh, correlation, Eric. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's both a correlation and also sort of a co-movement. I think of correlation, I think of like, 
comparisons of day-to-day prices using the correlation coefficient. That's definitely positive uh, most of the time. Um, but then, you know, co-movement, though, is being broader. You know, it's just kind of the concept that when prices of one are high, prices of the other tend to be high and vice versa. And so now this correlation, this nexus has held pretty well for most of this century, listeners, until the middle of last year. And we saw, obviously, if you've been paying attention to energy, we saw crude and nat gas obviously fall precipitously. Nat gas in particular get just annihilated out there. But crude uh, fall quite a bit. And crop prices, not so much. Now, now, Eric, when you see that kind of data, you know, your first supposition for that is, oh, that obviously has to be driven by what's going on over there in Ukraine. But as you point out in your report, maybe not so much, Eric. Yeah, I mean, there's probably an aspect to it that is driven by uh, by what's happened in Ukraine. Um, that would certainly explain what's gone on with wheat. Uh, Ukraine and Russia together um, are the world's primary exporters of wheat. To get Taken together, they export uh, roughly three times as much wheat as the next biggest producer on the United States uh, exports. Um, but it doesn't really explain other things too well. For example, Russia and Ukraine produce almost nothing in terms of soybeans. Um, they do produce a lot of sunflower oil. Um, and so all these markets have been kind of disturbed. And it explains why ag prices have you know, kind of trended higher and held higher, whereas crude prices have fallen. But there's maybe another deeper explanation, which is that the ag markets are actually more connected to gasoline and to diesel than they are to crude. I mean, after all, if you're a farmer, when you plow your fields and harvest your crops and plant your crops, et cetera, um, you're doing that with machines that are powered probably by diesel or by gasoline, but definitely not by raw crude oil. Um, you know, likewise, the output of these crops is added into fuel blends for gasoline and for diesel, uh, which themselves, of course, are products of the underlying crude oil. Um, so it seems like these markets are more heavily connected to um, to the product markets. And what's going on in the product versus crude oil is very interesting. Crude oil inventories around the world have generally been rising and they've generally been higher um, than they are typically at this time of year. Uh, so they're sort of abnormally high seasonal inventories. Uh, but the opposite is true for gasoline and for diesel. Uh, gasoline and diesel inventories have been relatively low. Um, and so the crack spread um, the spread between diesel and crude and between gasoline and crude has been exceptionally wide over the last year or so. Um, you know, so the spreads are very, very wide. And I think part of it may have to do uh, with the fact that we're producing a lot of crude oil, but we're kind of have bottlenecks in terms of refining capacity. Um, so we're producing a lot of crude oil, but we're having trouble turning that into products. Um, and so that's creating maybe a premium for diesel and gasoline and also a premium for the stuff that can be turned into fuel additives, including ethanol from corn and uh, biodiesel from, say, soybean oil, for example, or from palm oil. Um, and then just one last point here. This, in a way, could be connected to the Russo-Ukrainian war. Um, so Russia um, has, first of all, enormous refining capacity. Uh, but secondly, they also are an enormous exporter of crude oil. Um, as you know, as a result of the war, Europe has pretty much stopped buying oil from Russia, and so have uh, most close U.S. allies. Uh, Russia is still exporting crude oil, but they're exporting it, you know, uh, very circuitous, long routes, um, you know, that go, you know, for very long distances over to India, for example, or through pipelines that have somewhat limited capacity into China. Um, so they're still able to sell their crude oil, but they're selling it at a big discount. Um, what Russia's having trouble with, though, is exporting the products uh, because, you know, it's relatively easy to store crude oil on, on an ocean-going vessel. Uh, it's not quite so simple to store gasoline and diesel because these refined products are much more volatile and they can't be stored on every tanker that can take crude oil. Um, so um, there's sort of an abundance of crude oil coming from Russia, but there's not such an abundance of crude oil products. And so all of this may be impacting corn wheat and soybean prices so talking so much about crude oil let's start there listeners as i mentioned go into that to see me slash twifo report scroll down a couple of slots to energy then over to wti right at the top of the product family you see we're hanging out back in the 80 handle 82 and about a third right now up about about one and two thirds points on the week or a little over two percent obviously we're talking earlier about uh, the saudis and the russians deciding to 
try to boost those levels. And it has worked, at least in the near term. We were trading in the high 60s not too long ago, listeners. So uh, quite the move in crude oil over the better part of the last month. And that is translating into a little bit of paper, nearly half a million contracts on the tape right now this week. And of that, about a little over a third, about 34% going up in the May contract that goes out in about four days. So we talk a lot about zero day paper in the equities listeners, but um, very near dated paper right now in crude oil as well. Also interesting, energy is really the place you want to go right now if you're looking to find some volatility. How many times have we talked about it on this show? Most of the products we're going to talk about, I don't care if it's equities, if it's metals, if it's ags, most of them are somewhere in the 20s or in the case of VIX, now even below that, the high teens into the low 30s. That's pretty much where the lion's share of the products we're going to talk about fall from a vol perspective, except for energy and, of course, crypto out there a little bit as well. We have crude oil coming into the show right now. The vol looking a little bit north of that, looking right around the higher end of that range at about a, close to a, a 34 right now. So looking a little bit more robust. Again, I said we're hanging out at about 82 and a quarter. In terms of the action this week, it's kind of hard to parse the skew in a product that going out in just a few days. Let's go a little bit farther out. About 22% of the paper also went up in the June contract. Let's sink our teeth out there and see what's going on, listeners. And we have seen what is a, a mini equity skew popping up in crude oil for some time, which is a bid to the puts, a discount to the calls. But that remains the case again this week. If we go out to June, we see the puts last week were about 8% bid. This week, 10.1% bid. So the puts getting a little bit juicier. The calls, 5.2% cheap. This week, 6.3% cheap. So a discount to the calls, a bid to the puts, getting stronger in both directions. Uh, Looking again, much more like an equity this week from a skew perspective. And in terms of action, what was leading leading the dance out here this week? Listen, I said we're north of the 80 handle. It was the 80 puts going out in. Four days that were leading the dance this week, 13,500 of these bad boys going up. Uh, the big day for those was yesterday, Wednesday, 7,000, so pretty much half <laughs> going up yesterday. Most of that opening, about 3,000 today, 2,500 on Tuesday, about 1,500 Monday. So a little bit of back and forth earlier in the week, uh, but opening in the later portions of the week. And then if you want some upside action, how about some calls in June, listeners? The 85 calls in June. Also pretty active this week, 11,500 of those going up. The big day for those actually was Tuesday, about 4,500 on Tuesday, 3,500 on Wednesday, close to 3,000 today, only a few hundred on Monday. So looks like mostly opening on those June 85s out here this week as well. Let's, let's drill a little bit deeper in here to see what else was going up this week. Looks like also we had the 75 puts going out in four days. So if 80 puts, not doing it for you. How about the 75 puts? About 10,000 of those going up this week. And the big day for those was actually Monday. So interesting pockets of liquidity all across the board this week. About 5,000 going up on Monday, mostly closing. 3,300 on Tuesday, 1,500 on Wednesday, and just a couple of hundred today. Not much going on. Uh, 75 puts, people getting the heck out of Dodge on those on Monday. Makes some sense as we're rallying, seeing the news of these cuts coming in. Folks bailing on these puts that are going away in just a few days uh, makes a certain amount of sense. But Eric, you were also talking about this this nexus of crude oil with crops. So I think we'll keep that party rolling, listeners, and drop out of energy and go back up two slots in the asset class to ags. Uh, You were talking about wheat, but also corn. Uh, We do have corn on our movers and shakers this week. It is number four off about 2.2%. And we haven't had a chance to talk about corn very much on the show this on the show recently at all. So let's get out there this week, listeners. Corn hanging out at about a 653, up about almost 10 handles or about one and a half percent on the week. Obviously, if you go back to our show last week, the end of that show, it's off about 2.2%. So interesting week out here for all things corn. Not the most active of weeks, only 274,000 contracts. You can usually expect a little bit more paper out there on corn this week. And of that, about 34%. Again, that's the magic number going up in the May contract. This time that has about eight days to go. So a lot of near dated paper in energy and in ags out here this week. It's not just equities that are all coming for the near dated contracts these days, listeners. And what is the vol out here in corn? You're getting a little bit frothier. It's kind of a a weird term structure. It's all over the place. It's about 44 on this contract that has about eight days to go. It looks like that's up 24 points. So that seems like maybe a bit of a Aberrant print. You get a little bit beyond that. We're back into the high teens, uh, 18, 19 and a half. 
and you get a little bit beyond that up to about 20 up in the July, August, September time frame. So kind of all over the place from a vol perspective here in corn. And in terms of skew and this contract going out in eight days, man, we saw all sorts of wild action out here. The puts were 22.6% cheap last week, and the calls were 25.1% cheap. So those have both extreme discounts to both wings, which is, again, kind of weird. And maybe some of that, some of those prints were a little bit uh, off there. Coming in this week, 2.5% bid are the puts and 4.2% cheap. Oh, so that makes a little bit more sense than extreme discounts to both wings. <laughs> again, we've seen weirder stuff that could have happened, but I'll have to dig into the paper last week to see exactly what was going up out there. In terms of action this week in the corn listeners, I said we're at a 653 right now. It was the 660 calls. So again, the at the money calls going out in about eight days that are leading the dance with about 12,000 contracts. The big day for those Tuesday, 4,700. 3,300 going up today, 2,700 on Monday, and about 1,000 on Wednesday. It's like back and forth opening to closing all week, which, again, makes some sense. This is pretty much the at-the-money strike. So as we're flirting with it, going through it, coming back against it, uh, you're going to see people opening and closing. That that makes a lot of sense. All right behind it, we have the 650s. So the the at-the-money slash in-the-money strike now as well. It depends where we're hanging out in corn right now. About 10,000 contracts going up there. Uh, These were actually all closing this week, which is, Kind of interesting. About 3,500 on Tuesday, 3,000 on Monday, 1,500 yesterday, and about 1,800 today. Again, looks like pretty much closing throughout the week on the sixth half calls, which is kind of interesting. Maybe as we rallied to that strike and broke through it, folks were, uh, were taking some paper off or, or maybe just flirting around that strike. Folks wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. Either way, a lot of closing paper on these 650s. And right behind it, we also have the 670s also going up about 9,600 times. So it's a corn call strip. This week, listeners, uh, the big day for the 670, actually 670s were trading pretty evenly all week long. The big day was Tuesday again, about 3,000 on Tuesday, and then 2,000 to 2,200 the rest of the week. Uh, so pretty steadily active on the 670s, slightly closing on Monday, and the rest of the week looks like it was open. Interesting stuff. Uh, Eric, any of that paper I just talked about come as a bit of a surprise, or is that pretty much lining up how you thought looking at your research out here on the Energy, or I should say the crude oil crop price nexus, sir. Well, you know, I think what's really interesting here is that um, we've seen this huge pop in um, in oil prices, uh, but corn prices have actually come, you know, I'm talking about the spot market, has actually come kind of down in the opposite direction. It's actually been falling, um, you know, in recent days, ever since that OPEC decision, uh, which I think is kind of curious. I think oil and corn as well as wheat and soybeans, they all have one underlying driver of their performance, um, and that's China. Um, and so what's really interesting about China, though, is when their growth rate accelerates, uh, which it has been recently as they've lifted all these COVID restrictions that were in place up through mid-December, um, you know, China's growth rate is starting to accelerate a great deal, at least in the short term. That should ultimately prove to be very bullish for oil prices and for crop prices. Um, but what I think is really curious here is that oil and crop prices typically react to what's going on in China with a significant delay of up to one year. And the reason for that is China stores inordinate quantities of crude oil, uh, corn, wheat, and soybeans. For corn, wheat, and soy, soy they typically store like a you know, nine to 12 month reserve supply. Um, so as China's growth rate, I think, continues to recover from uh, the lifting of all the COVID restrictions, this could create a lot of demand for travel, uh, both inside and outside of China. Um, and that could put a bid in crude oil prices. And um, eventually, uh, through this nexus, as you describe it, between crude oil and, uh, and, and crops and between refined products and crops, um, this could eventually prove to be quite bullish uh, for, the, uh, you know, for the ag complex as well, including for corn. We can probably spend the rest of the show talking about this intersection of energy and ags. We have a lot more research I want to get to, including in the equities. So let's head there next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, listeners, to the equities we go. Pop out of that asset class for the ags. Go down about three slots to equity indexes. I usually hang out in the S&P, but uh, given what Eric's looking at in his research, may actually look a little bit small cap. In particular, Eric, 
You put out another piece just last week uh, talking about the Russell 2000, our old friends. I haven't talked about them on the show in a while. And an index most people don't talk about, Eric, the S&P 600. <laughs> Not one that gets bandied about a lot here on the show. So uh, I'm curious, what did you find in the intersection between these two? So um, basically, small cap stocks uh, relative to large cap. So comparing, say, the Russell 2000 to, say, the S&P 500 or the S&P 600 small cap to the S&P 500 large cap, um, small cap stocks have a tendency to outperform during periods of economic downturn. Um, That was true in the late 70s. It was true, say, between 79 and 82 when we had a double dip recession at the end of the Carter and beginning of the Reagan administrations. Um, It was true again in the very end of the 80s, especially the early 90s when we had the 90-91 90-91 recession, huge outperformance of small cap stocks. Um, and it was true again for a long period uh, from 2000 to about 2013. When we had the back-to-back tech wreck, war on terror, global financial crisis um, series of events. Um, and small cap stocks, on the other hand, tend to underperform large caps uh, by quite a significant margin during the later stages of expansion. Uh, during, just during that great 80s expansion, the great 90s expansion, as well as the sort of more mediocre expansion that we had uh, during the second two-thirds of the 20 teens, large cap stocks tend to ride the trends better. Uh, what was really interesting to me about last month uh, was that after the failure of SVB and Signature and Credit Suisse, small stocks Small cap stocks really suffered. They fell maybe 7.5% to 10% on the various indices, whereas large cap stocks like the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 uh, were up quite a lot. They were up maybe 5, 6, 7, 8% last month. Um, and what I think investors may have concluded, perhaps incorrectly, is that the U.S. economy and the world economy is heading into problems. Uh, that, that, I think, is correct because, you know, we've had these enormous interest rate increases uh, from the Fed, um, the ECB, the Bank of England. This is a sign of problems. But I think where the market may be getting this wrong um, is the market may be concluding, okay, well, large cap stocks are better positioned than small cap stocks are to ride this out. And I think that might not be true. Uh, because large cap stocks, first of all, tend to have much higher debt levels um, than small cap stocks relative to their revenue. So they're much more highly leveraged. That's not good when interest rates go up. Um, secondly, they tend to have a lot of international exposure. Um, so as international trade starts breaking down uh, between the U.S., China, and Russia, um, and as people in Europe and the U.S. start doing nearshoring, onshoring, friendshoring, all of this is very inflationary. It's not good for big multinationals, but it's potentially very lucrative for small cap stocks. Um, so I'm looking at small cap stocks here and thinking that relative to large caps, they might be really undervalued. Fascinating because you're right. They did take a beating early on in, in this big sell-off. They were very much the canary in the coal mine of some downside to come in the equity space. But now maybe, maybe Eric sounding like he thinks that's overdone. Well, we shall see small caps coming into the start of this segment, listeners, north of 1,800, so not quite flirting with 2,000 these days in the Russell 2000. But if Eric's right, maybe we'll be heading back that direction. Uh, 1,811 to be precise right now, up about 45 handles on the week or about 2.5%. So already a nice little resurgence out here for all things small caps. Uh, Almost 20,000 contracts on the tape, so a decently active week uh, for our friends out here in the Russell 2000. Of that... Actually, a little bit surprising, 23% of that going up in the contract that has eight days to go. So that's actually very long dated for equities these days. If I went and pulled up uh, the E-mini S&P 500 right now, listeners, the vast majority of that paper would be expiring today or in the next 24 hours. So it just shows how, how crazy all this is. By the way, Eric, I haven't had a chance to chat with you, obviously, in so long. Since the last time you and I chatted, We've seen this just tsunami, this explosion of interest in very near-dated equity paper, a lot of it intraday. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed this in your research. What are your thoughts on this explosion in the very near-dated portion of the curve? Well, you know, I think it's interesting. I think it's a reflection, perhaps, of the extent to which the equity market um, moves on, on, on pieces of information that come in very quickly. Um, some of these things are, of course, you know, known unknowns. 
uh, for example, economic data coming in. Uh, like we had, for example, in the last uh, week, we've had both the employment report, which originally came out on Good Friday, uh, but also the CPI numbers, which generated a big response earlier this week. Um, so we know the equity market, uh, mainly, I think, through its relationship with the bond market, another nexus to be talked about, um, is very sensitive to inflation and employment data. Um, but then, of course, with the equity market, you also have tons of other data incoming as well. You also have corporate earnings. We're about to get into earnings season. Um, corporations are going to begin announcing their earnings within the next few days, and that earnings season will take us through sort of early to mid-May. Um, and that, of course, is just a plethora of information, uh, some of which could be very, very impactful for market prices. Um, and of course, you have all the unknown unknowns, um, you know, all of the geopolitical risks and other things, um, you know, the sort of what other uh, signature banks or SVBs might be lurking out there uh, that we don't know about um, that can also have an impact on market prices. And so I think there's a real need, a real desire anyway, on the part of investors to hedge themselves using options versus those kinds of possibilities. It makes your job a little bit more challenging, too, because a lot of the traditional data sets you work with maybe don't focus on intraday as much, Eric, and that's where so much of the action is now in the equity space. I know it's challenging for a lot of people we talk to on the analytics side, on the back testing side, and indeed on the research side. They have to kind of change their perspective a little bit, so try to capture what's going on in the equity world. And as you're seeing from the other commodities we're talking about, a lot of the commodities are now are very very near dated from a liquidity perspective. So it does very much change the frame of reference. Speaking of frame of reference, let's get back to it here in the small caps. And we have more research. I want to try to squeeze into the show today. Listeners, uh, Russell 2000 this week, I said we're at about an 1811. It's the 18 quarter calls going out in about eight days that are leading the dance this week with about 500 contracts. Again, doesn't sound like a lot, but are talking 20,000 contracts total on the week. It was the 18 quarters. Then right behind it, we had the 1820s going up about 400 times. Looks like opening throughout the week. So maybe some uh, folks are buying what Eric's selling here on terms of some near-term upside in all things small caps. Actually, you know what? I buried the lead on this one. Looks like if we go a little bit farther out, we go out 36 days to the uh, week three May contract. We have about almost 700 of the 1875 calls going up this week. The big day for those was Monday, about 375 175 on Tuesday, the rest kind of scattered throughout the week, all opening as well. So a lot of upside call paper going up here in small caps this week. Interesting. Maybe they read Eric's paper and they're trying to get ahead of all this action. Speaking of get ahead of it, though, we got to keep rolling, listeners. It's time to move on into another fascinating complex these days. It's the metals. Werewolves beware. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. All right, listeners, welcome to the wonderful world, the shiny stuff. It's metals. If you listen to any of our shows these days, it's kind of hard to escape metals. We were just talking about gold on the option block. We've seen so much upside call activity in the variety of gold miners pick your poison out there there's calls trading in all of them and not just near dated at the money calls longer term far out of the money call explosions across the board it's it's a little bit alarming almost to see the unidirectional nature of so much paper and all these gold mining and gold associated names out there so it's fascinating stuff if you want to see what's going on in the mothership itself the actual gold options and futures listeners Go to that drop down, go almost to the bottom, go all second from the bottom to metals, and then go into precious, and then we're going to hang out in gold because Eric's recent research obviously also talking about a lot of, a lot of nexi coming up on the show this week, listeners, the intersection of gold and, of course, rates. Those two are very much synonymous with each other. Eric, you and I haven't chatted in a long time, and since the last time you and I chatted, one of the most frequent refrains slash complaints we heard on the network was, what the hell is going on with gold, especially last year? Everyone had it in their portfolio for a year like last year, and yet gold, I think to put it mildly, did not deliver last year. You investigated that in your research. What did you find, sir? Yeah, you know, gold has actually been stagnating. It was more than just last year. Gold actually uh, really peaked out. Um, in July 2020. Um, so it was actually two years and nine months 
uh, that it's now been moving sideways. And so right now we're basically back to the top end of its range, but it has not, at least on an intraday basis, it has not broken through its twin highs from uh, July 2020 or from early 2022. Um, so you're right, this is a big mystery. So we've had this huge resurgence in inflation. Why is gold, which is supposedly an inflation hedge, not rallying? Why has it been generally moving sideways? I know it's rallied a lot since November. Uh, it's gone from 1600 back to over 2000, which is a nice move, but it doesn't really exit its range yet. Um, we still have inflation you know, at over 5% on the core, which is pretty amazing. Um, so what's going on here, I think it's pretty simple. It's that gold is still an inflation hedge, but gold is very closely tied to expectations for short-term interest rates. Um, so when an expectation develops that the Federal Reserve is going to slash interest rates, um, gold prices tend to rally. And when the market begins to expect the Fed's going to raise rates, gold prices tend to fall. Um, so what's happened here over, the, say, the last four years is really interesting. When you go back to the end of 2018, um, the Fed had been in this sort of three-year, very mild tightening cycle. And at the end of 2018, the market started to price, the interest rate market started to price that the Fed was going to start cutting rates. And the market was right. The Fed eventually slashed rates back to zero. I mean, as that expectation developed, gold soared. It went from twelve hundred to over two thousand dollars an ounce. Um, so it had you know, this enormous up move of over sixty percent gain. Um, so you could say that you know, in twenty nineteen and the first half of twenty twenty, gold prices correctly factored in the massive wave of inflation that we subsequently got. But the problem for gold is once that wave of inflation hit it dramatically changed market expectations for Fed policy. Um, the market went from expecting no Fed rate hikes for as far as the eye could see. Um, as recently as uh, the beginning of last year, late 2021, to suddenly realizing, oh my gosh, the Fed has to raise interest rates to maybe above 5% to get this under control. Um, so as that expectation developed, that was not good for gold. Um, it not only restrained gold from going higher, but it actually for a while, think gold prices lower. Um, but since uh, last fall, um, these expectations have started moving in the other direction. Now the interest rate market is saying, okay, the Fed's getting close to 5%. They might put it over 5% at the next meeting in May. And that might be way beyond what the economy can handle in terms of rates. So we have a massively inverted yield curve. Uh, the Fed funds market is pricing that the Fed most likely goes up 25 basis points at the next meeting, but then maybe as soon as July starts slashing rates and starts cutting rates maybe a quarter point at every meeting to, until the end of next year, at which point the market prices that they'll have rates back down to around 3%. Um, so gold has been rallying on this basis of expecting that the Fed is going to start slashing rates. Um, and the problem with this is it, it, well, it, it could be true that the Fed does slash rates. So there's essentially two problems. The first problem is, well, what if core inflation remains persistent? Uh, we've seen headline inflation drop with energy prices, but as you pointed out, oil is now on the way back up. So we're going to see a, probably a bounce in headline, headline inflation. But core inflation hasn't come down. It actually ticked up last month to 5.6%. Um, and so how on earth is going to Fed going to cut rates if core inflation is so sticky and so persistent? Um, so, and if they can't cut rates, that might not be good for gold. So gold's coming up to this major resistance area around 2080 an ounce, which is its intraday highs from uh, 2020 and 20, early 2022. Um, and so the question is, is gold going to be able to get through that? And when you look at the gold market, as I look at it on our CVOL tool, um, the up var is around 19%. Uh, so the options trading above the, 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 the strikes above the uh, current um, you know, trading level for gold futures are you know, nearly 19% implied vol. Down var is only 16.5%. So the market's very skewed. It thinks the risk is upward, but the market might be wrong. You know, in my research, um, when the gold market is more concerned with extreme upside than extreme downside risk, prices usually go the opposite way that traders fear. Prices usually wind up going down when people are more concerned with extreme upside risk.
Let's take a look at what's going on out there in gold. Listeners, this call tsunami that's just rippling across all of the gold-related names. Is it continuing out here in the actual gold options? Let's find out this week coming into the start of this segment. Listeners, gold at right around 20 half, 2052, up another 26 handles or 1.3% on the week. How much paper going up out here in the gold options? A pretty active week, 222,000 contracts on the tape. So gold. Not messing around, listeners, but unlike the equities and everything else, it's not all near data. There is a lot of near data paper. Don't get me wrong. We have 21% of the paper going up in the May contract that has 12 days, but the actual winner is 23% going up in the June contract that has about 42 days to go. So gold usually tends to skew a little bit more long dated, and that remains the case again here this week. So we're going out to June here, listeners. Uh, what is the vol? You might be wondering, Eric was just talking about the C vol in gold and the implied right now in June is at about a 16 and two thirds off about three quarters of a point. You know, gold's never been known as a bastion of volatility, except in some strange moments and given up some of that vol, but still nearly a 17. That's nothing to sneeze at when it comes to volatility out in gold. But given the movements we've seen out there of late, you could probably argue that is certainly merited uh, in terms of the skew. again. Fascinating stuff. If you want to talk about gold skew in more detail, again, I encourage you to dive deeply into Eric's report. He has some interesting analysis about gold skew and what that really means, because very frequently we see the upside bid when it comes to the precious metals. And that is the case again this week. Uh, Calls were 6.2% bid last week, 7.1% bid this week. And the puts 3.7% cheap last week, 5.5% cheap this week. So no one wants the puts. Everyone wants to call. You might say, well, that this leads to more upside to come. That could be the case. But again, check out Eric's research, as he points out there. When the skew is heavily bid to the upside, gold sometimes tends to underperform in those moments. So uh, intriguing stuff there. In terms of what was leading the dance out here in gold this week, listeners, it was all the way out actually to December. It was the December 2,500 calls doing about 10,500 contracts this week. Almost all of that today. So. If you're asking, does that call explosion in gold that we've seen across the board, is that continuing? The answer is yes, it's happening right now as we speak, listeners. Nearly 9,000 of these D's 2500s have gone up already today. 1,200 on Tuesday. Those were slightly closing. Worth noting, there are about 21,000 contracts open, so they could be taking some of these off. Uh, They have had an aggressive move out here. Maybe they're deciding to take them off. It would be an early time to be unwinding the D's 2500s, especially if you have Uh, Some interest in the upside. If you're looking at what Eric's talking about, maybe you think we we have some interesting times ahead for gold, then uh, maybe you want to keep those on. But maybe some folks taking them off or they could be piling in. We'll know more next week when we look at these numbers. But the D2500s are leading the dance out here this week. That's kind of interesting. Would not have been my first choice. Going out here to the May 2100s, that's uh, the number two contract with about 6,500 contracts going up this week. Uh, the big day for those was actually yesterday, 3,700 yesterday, 2,300 today. Uh, looks like slightly closing yesterday. Obviously, we don't know about today. Not much open there, only about 3,600 open. So it could be taking them off, but uh, I suppose we'll we'll know more again this time next week. So 2,100s going out in about 11 to 12 days. <laughs> and then we have the 2,500s going out in, oh, 228 days, <laughs> dominating the tape out here this week. A weird times for gold. If you want even more strangeness afoot, listeners, you know gold's always good for some funky upside. How about 2,500, I should say, of the De- 2024 3,000 calls? How about those bad boys? Those were going up today as well. Today's just a Paul Palooza in gold. That's all opening because there's no OI to speak of on that strike. So someone opening for size on the D's 2024 3,000s. I'd love to sink my teeth into all of that, but we have more research I want to get to and there. We're coming up against it here on the show, listeners. The Fed, the yield curve, inflation fears. How are they impacting options activity and volatility in your favorite interest rate products? Let's find out as we explore the world of rates. Eric, you kind of were just touching on rates. If you want to add any more detail, because of course you have your paper, I should say, you just put out a few weeks ago, kind of breaking down what you were just talking about, that delicate dance the Fed has to do right now. I certainly don't envy them, even though you could argue maybe some of it of their own making. We have 
uh, rampant inflation and then also weakness in the banks. So maybe kind of putting the brakes on them. So if you want to add any more on that paper you just put out a couple of weeks ago about that complicated dilemma. And then to wind us up here, you put some interesting, I suppose you could call it miscellaneous research out recently as well. Not something we often talk about here on the network, but fascinating stuff nonetheless about the shift going on right now in worker demand in the labor supply out there. So fascinating stuff. Anything you want to add on those two before we wrap up for the week, Eric? Have at it. Well, you know, I think that the the, the Fed and, and the workers issue are pretty closely related. I mean, we're seeing labor shortages in many sectors of the U.S. Um, and in, in much of Europe as well, especially for uh, service industry labor at places like restaurants, um, anything to do with hospitality, hotels, et cetera. Um, a lot of workers have retired and not come back to the labor force. And this is creating upward pressure on inflation. Uh, but it's not the only thing doing that. We're also seeing increasing defense spending, especially in Europe, but also in the U.S. Um, and a sort of circling of the wagons on trade. The era of free trade agreement seems to be over. And now everybody's kind of bringing production of key uh, goods back onshore or near shore or to at least friendly shores. Uh, um, and all of this, I think, is potentially quite inflationary. And it creates a dilemma for the central banks. Uh, the Fed's dilemma, which is the same as the Bank of England, the Swiss National Bank, and the ECB, is ultimately they may be forced to choose uh, between continuing to fight inflation by raising rates and financial stability. Uh, we saw that play out here in the UK last September when the Bank of England um, they you know, had this problem in the gilt market, which is the UK treasury market. Yields suddenly spiked from 3 to 5% on the tenure, which is an enormous move. The tenure fell over 20% in price. Um, and in the midst of a tightening cycle, the Bank of England was forced to print a bunch of money. Uh, well, the Fed had to do kind of the same thing in March. You know, officially, the Fed is supposed to be shrinking its balance sheet, but actually expanded its balance sheet a lot last month in order to sort of deal with the loans from SVB and from uh, Signature Bank. And the SNB, the Swiss National Bank, had to do the same thing when Credit Suisse uh, sort of failed over that weekend and got merged abruptly into UBS, uh, its, its domestic rival. Um, so all central banks, I think, are going to face this choice between fighting inflation and financial stability. And the problem is we don't really know where the source of instability is going to come from. Uh, but I suspect the commercial property market is going to be one potential source. Um, over leveraged uh, corporations, um, including a lot of private equity managers, and maybe some venture capital firms um, who have borrowed money on the cheap and are now having to you know, refinance at much higher rates. Um, there's a lot of vulnerabilities in the system out there. And when the Fed moves rates from zero to 5%, eventually something's going to go pop. Um, so I think it's going to be very, very interesting times ahead for rate markets and very, very volatile. Well, Eric, that music means you have survived another journey here through Twifo. It's been a while. How was it? Did you have fun, sir? I had a great time and I can't wait to be back. It'll be another two years, so who knows what's going to happen in the markets by then. But I like to leave a little bit of time at the end of the show for you, Eric, because you're always working on some fascinating stuff. So before we go, if you want to leave our listeners with any hints, any teases of what you and the rest of the research team over there at CME have up your sleeves, now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah, so we're working on essentially four things. So I'll go through them real quick. First, uh, three of them directly related to options. Uh, so first, we hinted at this before. Um, for certain markets, including for gold, silver, copper, um, diesel, gasoline, and crude oil, um, they tend to move the opposite direction of the skew. So when people are, are fearing extreme downside risk more than extreme upside risk, prices in those uh, six markets tend to rally. And when um, people are fearing uh, extreme upside risk more than extreme downside risk, prices have tended to fall. Um, so they, even if you're not an options trader, looking at the vol skew uh, can still be very meaningful in terms of informing you uh, for what might happen to futures prices. Um, yeah, they seem to be sort of contrary indicators. Uh, but there are certain markets like the treasury market where it's the opposite is true. Uh, when treasury markets uh, see an preponderance of upside risk in terms of price, 
prices more often than not have tended to move upwards and vice versa. Um, that may be because central banks, once they start moving policy, they tend to just keep going for a long time and the markets know that. Um, that's one thing. Another thing, uh, volatility cycles. We've talked about this in the past. Uh, but the key thing to understand here is if central banks tighten policy, they take money out of markets. And as they take money out of markets, volatility tends to rise. Uh, we've had the sharpest rate tightening cycle in 42 years in the U.S. and Europe. Um, the Fed's taking a lot of money out of markets, so is the ECB and the Bank of England. The most likely consequence is we're going to see a large rise in volatility. And that's important because as I look through markets right now at this moment, volatility in so many markets is trading cheap. Um, third, also very interesting, very brief, the AGS markets. The AGS markets, call options are almost always more expensive than put options, uh, which I find very strange because there's no tendency on the part of futures prices to have more extreme upside than extreme downside moves. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing for a liquidity provider to look at um, and see why it is that calls tend to be so much more expensive than puts in the ag market, kind of in general, not at every moment, but sort of in general. Um, and then lastly, the other big research piece is not directly option related, but could have a lot of consequences for options. And that's how markets might react um, if the U.S. has a default on its debt later this year um, as a result of the budget uh, crunch in Washington between the, uh, the House of Representatives and the White House. Um, and it's going to look back at 2011 and see the enormous moves that resulted as, uh, as part of that a whole episode in which the S&P fell nearly 20% that summer um, and, of course, had a huge spike in volatility. There you go. You know where to go to check out all of that great research at cmegroup.com and then go to the Insights tab. That's where you're going to find Eric's under the economic research there. It's all there. I encourage you if you're even remotely interested in this and you're listening to a show like this, so I have to assume that you are. Uh, check them all out. Great visuals, great graphs, great charts that will really help it pop off the page for you. And of course, while you're there, if you want to slum it in our TWIFO report, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO. That's the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires on all that data we were talking about today and a whole bunch more we didn't have a chance to get to. That is going to do it for us on the network today. Back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. A lot to break down in the world of equity volatility. We're going to do it. On Vol Views, the once in future and now present Dr. Vicks will be joining us to break all that down and a whole bunch more. And then after that, for all you pro folks, we'll be diving into all things options, oddity. Should be a fascinating week. I got a feeling <laughs> some gold upside is going to make it in there. It just, uh, just from what we've been talking about on the network all week, it's unavoidable. Gold upside is all the rage. We'll break that down and a whole bunch more on options, oddities. Then back again next week, all the way through to next Thursday, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 